Scripture seems to be littered with references to the idea that people should be able to believe in God. Romans 1 is a famous example of God saying that essentially the evidence that's been provided to, to everybody is such that they are without excuse for not having belief in him. But then also saying that actually, no, the reason that you don't feel God is because God has good reason to sort of hide himself from you. These seem to rub up against each other. When you look at these arguments, or again, the ontological argument, which you now describe as beautiful or magical, couldn't you then somehow say that when you compare where you're at now in relation to where you stood five years ago, dare I say, like, could you say that in with regard to this argument, God has kind of come out of the hiding? I'm not asking for God to mm -hmm. sort of hold my hand through this lived experience. I'm asking once, just enough to form a belief that he exists. If I can have just that just once, mm. then I'll become the most prolific Christian okay. apologist that you've ever met. Hi, and welcome back to the channel. You're about to watch an episode of Unbelievable, which is a Christian radio show hosted by my friend Justin Brierley, which seeks to bring Christians and non-Christians together to discuss Christian and non-Christian stuff. Justin's been filming his shows remotely as of late because his studio is under construction, but Lucas Ruger was the other guest in this episode and hosts the YouTube channel Deflate, which is dedicated to Christian apologetics, was in the United Kingdom, and so we decided that we simply had to do it in person. And so we found a room in Wycliffe College in Oxford, and I provided the cameras and the lights and the microphones, which of course a big thanks to my supporters on Patreon for allowing me to fund such endeavours. We booked a room and we decided to do it in person. The discussion was on divine hiddenness. If there is a God and God loves us, then why is he so hidden from us so much of the time? For me, this is a good reason to think that maybe our credence in atheism should be increased, whereas for Lucas, this is an answerable objection to theism, and that's the discussion that you're about to watch. Now, it just so happens that Max baker Heitch, who is a tutor in philosophy at Oxford and a previous guest on Unbelievable, was in the room since he helped us to procure the room in Wycliffe Hall. And so after the episode concluded, we decided to sit down with him and discuss what we just discussed. So that will be at the end of this episode after it finishes, a short clip where Lucas, myself, Justin, and Max baker Heitch discuss a little bit more of the problem of divine hiddenness. And I think it's really worth sticking around for. It was maybe my favorite part of the discussion, actually. So with that said, if you like this video and you like my work generally, please do consider becoming a supporter at patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic and enjoy the show. Well, hello and welcome to the show. Bit of a special one for you today, a bit different. We are live from Oxford. Uh, in fact, we are here in Wycliffe Hall, which is a theological college in Oxford. And you can probably hear a little bit of the background because it's a hot summer's day uh, and we've got the window open. Uh, we're here in one of the rooms and it's been generously organised by Max Baker Hitch, who may make an appearance later on in the show. He's one of the tutors here. But I am joined by Alex O'Connor and Lucas Ruger. Uh, and it's it's wonderful to be able to do this in person. Isn't it nice to yeah. actually be here all together? It is. How novel. We've all got used to doing <laughs> things remotely uh, over Skype and Zoom and whatever. But anyway, it's nice to be here in person. And we we thought, well, what could we talk about um, since we're all here? Uh, the hiddenness of God is what we decided, because um, I'm not aware that you've gone into massive depth. I know you've touched on it in various debates yourself, Alex. Yeah. Um, and I know it's something that you're interested in, in talking about. It's a significant objection to theism. Um, and, uh, and maybe what would be good is to just tell us a little bit, well, define what this problem is this objection is i don't know whether you want to start us off on that one lucas or, or maybe maybe as as you're here to make the case for mm. the hiddenness objection why don't we start with you alex well divine hiddenness is one of i think the few arguments that are available to a strong a atheist to try to argue that there is no god most atheists i know define themselves as passive atheists what what uh, a lot of people would just call an agnostic. They're just sort of not convinced of this proposition that God exists. And so a lot of the debate consists in argument being put forward and then holes being poked in the in, in the argument, which is easier to do, I think, than to produce a worldview to mm. try and defend if you're just somebody who's able to take arguments for God's existence and poke holes in them. Uh, I, I think you've got a bit of an easier ride, but there are a few things you can do to say that actually maybe God does not exist. And this doesn't commit you to the view that God doesn't exist. You don't have to say that that's what you actually believe. You can still be on the fence, but perhaps you're on the fence because you think there are good arguments this way, good arguments that way. So one good argument that way might be this problem of divine hiddenness. 
And there are a few different ways to approach it, but it's, it's a fairly intuitive point that if there were a God who existed, and particularly a God who loved us and wanted to enter into a relationship with anybody who was willing and able, it seems surprising, at the very least, that so many people are restricted from experience of or with this God for so much of the time. Now, a lot of people like to think of this as a version of the problem of evil. It basically falls with, uh, under the same category of why does God allow bad thing to happen? Because, of course, for an atheist, it, it might not be seen as, as bad that you don't have a religious experience. But if there were a God who existed and he restricted his presence from, from human beings, that would be a bad thing. It would be much better if we could all be sort of happily in relation with him all the time. So it's essentially a, a version of the problem of evil, but it's quite a particular one and it's quite a potent one because it's one of the main things that I think uh, causes people to lose their faith. I wouldn't say it's one of these things that that uh, sustains atheism argumentatively. It's not brought up so much, but in the experience of a believer who ends up throwing off their faith, it's often because they go through a period of just silence from deaf heaven, as it were, and they don't really know how to make sense of that. Of course, there are ways to try and make sense of this, right? And so historically, people have put forward lots of suggestions as to why it might be that God is hiding his face from us. There might be sort of sufficient moral warrant. It might be better for our character. He might sort of be impinging upon our ability to freely come to know him if he makes his existence constantly present to us. There are these kinds of responses. These are often very similar to the kind of responses that you get to the problem of evil. It's essentially just a suggestion that there might be some kind of sufficient moral warrant. Um, for me, these responses just don't cut it. At least they seem a bit ad hoc to me. And I, I imagine we'll be getting into discussing a few of those. Um, but Really, the argument is that if there were, I mean, you can put it quite formally, as, as Schellenberg famously did in saying that if there is a God who exists, who's perfectly loving, then non-resistant non-belief would not occur. Um, and what can you just, for those who haven't come across Schellenberg's version of it, what, what does this non-resistant bit mean? It's an important distinction. Of course, there are non-believers who could be described as resistant to belief in God for various reasons. Maybe you're, you're anti-theists who say, well, I don't think it's true, but I don't want it to be yeah. true. Or people, um, people who, we all know that some people uh, in approaching certain topics will almost subconsciously, but somehow willingly, if they don't want something to be true, blind themselves to particular kinds of evidence. This is something you see on, on both sides of the debate. So some people like resist, right? And so if I was just like, look, I'm I'm not going to read that, that nonsense. I'm not going to read the gospel. I'm not going to engage in the debate. But all of this religious stuff is, is ridiculous. Somebody would probably have a right to say to me, look, you're obviously not seeking properly. But the non-resistant non-believer is the person who has no objection to entering into a relationship with God. And in fact, desires it and this would be someone that, like like myself i think like if, if it's there i'm i'm here for it i really am i'm i'm, I'm open to it that is i'm non-resistant to this yeah. belief in god and so the reason we add that non-resistant clause is to say that is, is to prevent somebody from saying well maybe you're just sort of hardening your heart or something like this we're, we're, as long as there is a single example just one of a truly non-resistant non-believer then it seems that the theist needs to explain why it is that God would hide his face from them, or at least give us plausible reason to think that there could be such a reason. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a really helpful way into <clears throat> the argument. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think we meet this in a kind of non-philosophical form quite a lot, yeah. don't we, uh, Luke? Because it's, you know, people saying, well, I haven't, you know, I'm open to God, but yeah. God hasn't shown up in my life. So, yeah. so you know, surely it's, it's down to God in the end. And if God's there, then God will know what to do to make me believe and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, wh wh where do you start with this one? Yeah, definitely. And I would also add, I think it's something that the, even the Christian or the believer can relate to in the sense that they will experience, you know, periods or times where they feel like, well, where is God? You know, I can read the Bible or go to church, but I, it feels like there is nothing tangible or nothing relatable. So in this sense, I do think that intuitively the argument makes makes sense and, and or should make sense, I think, even uh, to the Christian. Now, I just very generally speaking, like one of the responses or, or one of the basic things to, to, to think about when divine hiddenness comes up is, is this. If, like on what grounds are we to believe that, you know, this one argument, if you refer to, to how Schellenberg put it, you know, the divine 
the argument from divine hiddenness against God's existence. In, in what sense are we to believe that the assertion or the perception of the skeptic or of someone like Schellenberg, that there isn't enough evidence for God, kind of throws out all we know from natural theology and, and, and does so objectively speaking. So it seems like you have divine hiddenness as an argument on the one side and on the other side you have all the data you get or all the arguments you get from natural theology and it seems like on a very basic level that the argument as such seems to kind of claim that all of this needs to be put aside because na natural theology as such is basically the claim that you know you you look at the world as it is you don't need special revelation uh, and with the data you get you can make inference to the existence of god so i think that's one of the basic issues that uh, that, yeah. that you would want to look at when when the argument so, comes so, up. so the 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 point being that the fact that there is this objection of mm -hmm. the hiddenness of god doesn't necessarily outweigh all of those other issues exactly yeah. because again when you look at fine-tuning or cosmological arguments i mean these are ways that even atheist thinkers would would say and i mean alex you you've made kind of comments recently where you feel like well there has been raised credence in these arguments with with how you've looked at them yeah. again yeah so the question is well now like what weighs heavier is it yeah. the divine hiddenness argument which basically says there is not enough evidence for a person to believe in god or is it the stuff that is being talked about yeah. in natural yeah. theology? So Yeah, w what do mm -hmm. you want to say to that, Alex? Well, the divine hiddenness problem, I, I don't think I'd, I would characterize it as the, the problem that there sort of isn't enough evidence mm -hmm. per se. It's more something about the effect that that evidence has on mm -hmm. the person who's considering belief. So, you know, I think there's a great deal of, of good evidence in terms of what is argumentatively sound. Um, you know the fine tuning argument you can make respond re responses to it but yeah it's a it's a powerful consideration why are the continents so finely tuned the argument from reason seems to be a powerful sort of undercutting uh reason to sort of distrust our our very reasoning faculties on atheism these kinds of things i, th I think they they are powerful argumentatively in a kind of academic sense they're they're easy to defend and difficult to argue against but of course particularly for christianity Religion is not about natural theology. Natural theology is this this strange philosophical wart on the side of, of what is supposed to be this glorious relationship with a loving person. I, I don't know if the mm. natural theologians will appreciate being compared to a wart, <laughs> but you know, I'll, perhaps I'll, not. We'll let that go. But I, I feel like it's 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 such a. It, it seems to me if Christianity were true, it, it would be the sort of wrong way to be approaching sure. the, I mean, this we, kind of conversation in practice. The, we don't all walk around as philosophers, you know, in, when we're Christians. And, and yeah. I've always worried slightly that the maybe a lot of the non-Christians and atheists who watch these shows and yours think that, well, this must be what Christianity is. If I was a Christian, I'd just be going around <laughs> quoting the ontological argument or something. And that's that's not quite the reality. Well, I think what, it rises it up like. as, as yeah. a response to, to sort of your intellectual atheists of history yeah. who said, look, we've got this kind of academic way of viewing the world. We like to put things in a microscope. We like to formalize and, and mathematize this kind of thing. And, and, and we sort of try to sort of taxonomize the entire world into this complete scientific understanding that if we manage to to fill out we'll explain everything and the theist comes along and says well actually i'm not so sure about that and they start sort of arguing on those terms and you end up with this this highly academic formalized premise premise conclusion which of course i find in, uh, interesting i've made a career out of discussing this stuff for the past half decade but of course i'm an atheist right like i i think that this is sort of interesting from a philosophical perspective but if i were a christian i would think that mm -hmm. this this is not where i would expect to find the 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 focal point of the christian faith this is supposed to be about a relationship i think yeah. look if if god has not revealed himself through through uh prayer or reflection or through religious experience it'd be very bizarre indeed for me to kind of put my eye down a microscope look at like a particular way that an, an atom wriggles or something and go ah oh, there he is you know yeah. it would be a very strange place right. for him to reveal yeah. himself and so i wouldn't expect so so when i say that sort of the natural theological arguments that they're, they're argumentatively sound i think they are but they don't move me and i don't think yeah. they move a lot of people and i think if you ask people why they convert to christianity or to theism from atheism very rarely do they report that it's because they sat down and read a particular argument in the Blackwell Companion to Natural the, the, Theology? Sometimes that is part of a wider picture. Obviously, there there is some kind of intellectual 
questions that got answered and then perhaps there was also an cool. additional experience or whatever but yeah what how, how would you want to respond Lucas? yeah so let me just rephrase that yeah. back to you just in order to make sure i understand you properly so are you basically saying that there needs to be a way to experience god or to have like an experiential aspect to your relationship to god rather than just an intellectual kind of wrestling and argumenting i kind of I, I went on a strange detour but i didn't mm. actually i think i didn't actually quite get to the point yeah. um which is my fault which is that if there is a lot of evidence the problem is not so much whether that evidence has been provided but why that evidence doesn't move a person because you could provide all the evidence in the world but if I'm just of this kind of psychological constitution where it just doesn't land with me, you could say something like there's a sense in which you might want to say, well, that's kind of on you because there is enough evidence and you're just not accepting it for some reason. But whatever that reason is, is as mysterious to me as it is to you. Like, why is it that somebody will say to me, look, you have all of this, all of this evidence. You have the fine tuning argument. You have the cosmological considerations. You have like the, your moral intuition, all of this kind of stuff. Like, why are you not a theist? To which I just want to say, well, that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Why not? Why is it indeed that in the face of all of these supposed evidences, mm -hmm. I am just not moved? Now it might be something to do with me. It might be that yeah. I'm doing it wrong. It might be that I'm sort of not opening my my heart to God. But I, I at least feel as though I've done that. And I'd like yeah. to ask any theist who thinks I'm not what they would advise that I do if they think that I've not been doing it properly. You know. But so it's not so much about the evidence, but rather the the sort of lack of potency that the evidence has in actually forming a belief within a person. Okay, so I guess then we're really talking about, well, you, you know, some a person like yourself looking at the evidence. And I think that the, the, the crucial turn there is it doesn't move you. So what do you, I mean, could you kind of mention another example where, where the evidence moves you to, you know, to action or to, to whatever it's supposed, it's supposed to, to move you towards? Because I feel like, you know, I can look at, I don't know, I, I can look at any piece of evidence about anything, I don't know, about, you know, trees or I don't know, transportation, whatever, and not be moved by it. The question is, well, well, why should a piece of data or like a body of data move me to anything? I'm not I'm not trying to kind of to trick you or to undermine you in any in any sense, but just trying to understand what do you understand under this term that that evidence should move you? Because I, I, that's a, like the way I see it is that while well, you're presented with evidence and if something makes sense to you then the most reasonable thing is for you to act in accordance with it i mean take the example of smoking i mean it's it's quite out of question that smoking damages your health so that means that well people should be moved to not smoke but that's not what what happens so that the question is or it seems to me that the problem is not with the evidence as such which can or cannot move people to do something or to act in a certain way so what what is this moving except what do you think i mean I, i'm just well, curious there, there are some arguments that i have experienced that have sort of moved me to change my beliefs and it, and it happens yeah. essentially non-consensually this is the weird thing about becoming convinced of an argument it just sort of happens to you right and so so for example when i first started considering arguments surrounding free will when i was like 17 or something and i never really thought about it and you know i listened to the audiobook of sam harris's book about free will and I'm just kind of staring off into space like this is incredible and and that seemed to have an effect and i think that the reason has got something to do with maybe if you can present a sort of valid syllogism a deductive argument in which i sort of believe the premises then i have no choice but to believe the conclusion and so natural theology has a has a number of deductive arguments like the kalam cosmological argument or the ontological argument or something and, mm -hmm. and I, i'm when i say that that these arguments are, are sound and i think that they're successful what I mean is that they're valid, that, you know, they do actually work and that the premises sort of, they seem intuitive. We have some good reason to believe them. But of course, it all rides on exactly how much credence you give mm -hmm. to those premises. And so when you're talking about something like smoking, we have fairly well-defined parameters. We know what sort of health means. We, we've, yeah. we've defined it for our own purposes. Um, we know the, the effects that smoking has on a body, this kind of thing, right? But when you're talking about everything that begins to exist has a cause, sure, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Because I, I guess if, if it didn't, then, you know, wouldn't this kind of thing happen all the time? Like, maybe, I, I, but I don't, I don't know. Like, this is, this is so, there's such a different grasp that we have on these yeah. kinds of considerations that, like, yeah, I think the argument's valid, and I think, sure, I mean, it makes sense that everything that begins to exist has a cause, but 
it doesn't have the same kind of undeniable force. And the only other thing is that because this is attached to a worldview that says that this is a God who is the author of the universe and has created the universe for you so that he can enjoy a relationship with you, I think I would expect something a little bit more strong than, you know, my belief that a tree is green or something or, or that, you know, that this tree is 200 years old or something like that. Mm. I'd expect that if there were an argument that came along that were going to sort of push me onto theism, that that the, the recognition that I'd actually become somewhere within me convinced that this was yeah. the case would be evidenced by the fact that I'd feel something a bit grander than the kind of experiences that would be attached to more, mm. you know, subtle beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, you know, different people are obviously, there's going to be lots of factors that go into why a certain argument convinces one person, but doesn't end up convincing another person. And that may not just be mm -hmm. how sound the argument is, it might be their psychological kind of, you know, response to it and everything else. Um, but ultimately, we know that, that you know, on the face of it, there are lots of people who are out there who've maybe heard a lot of the arguments, tried to kind of be as open as they can be, as, as Alex says he has been. Uh, Lucas and say but you know despite all my openness and my searching and my reading of the gospels and even maybe I've tried to pray and just you know mm -hmm. put a, you know say god if you're there you know respond uh, I'm I'm open they say it still hasn't happened and on that basis they say if god is good if god as you say wants to be in relationship with people why hasn't it happened to me why are there other people like me it hasn't happened to does is this evidence therefore that there's not a god on the other end um, yeah. um and and so where where do you go with that because it, in simple terms, that's sort of Schellenberger's argument, I think. It's that, it's that if there are these non-resistant atheists and non-believers, God, uh, there's no reason, we he can't see any particularly good reason why God wouldn't be revealing God's self to that person. Yeah, or not revealing himself yet. I think, mm. and I've mentioned this like previous to our conversation, I think there is a kind of a snapshot Mm -hmm. frame of reverence reference you can take when talking about this problem of hiddenness which i by which i mean you know how do i feel about god or how do i think about god today on this 11th of july in mm. 2022 and it seems to me you know someone might say well god is hidden well i can't experience him again both the christian or the non-christian may actually have that sort of sentiment or feeling but then the, another way to look at the whole issue is well you look at the period of time and well, how has has God been revealing himself to me or have I experienced some sort of increased relationship or increased depth of relationship with God? And here is like, I'd like to get back to kind of to your specific case, Alex, if I'm allowed to call it, kind of call it that. It's I, I looked at, you know, in recently in your conversation with Joe Schmidt, um, where you put up this tier list for uh, arguments for God's existence. You mentioned, and I was struck. I thought, like, I, I thought it was quite beautiful or inspiring. You said, you know, the ontological argument is now. I don't know if you meant it sarcastically or anything, but you said it's beautiful, and you, I mean, you used the word. There's something magical about it, which to me suggests something very much along the lines of, well, this actually moves me. You know, that this does something to me. Whereas, and so I went back. And checked out what you said a couple of years ago about the ontological argument. And you literally said, I don't think this is even worth the time to bring it up in a debate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so here's what here's what I like to suggest. And there's other things which you mentioned about other arguments in in that video or in that conversation with Joe Schmidt, where, where I thought, and I went back and checked out other videos and I felt like, well, there's this, there's a very stark contrast. I mean. This is the problem with YouTube. You can check what you said, you <laughs> yeah. know, two no, or three years so, ago. So what I'd like to suggest <laughs> is, so in a certain way, when you look at these arguments, or again, the ontological argument, which some, which you now describe as beautiful or magical, couldn't you then somehow say that when you compare where you're at now in relation to where you stood five years ago, hasn't, like, dare I say, like, could you say that in with regard to this argument, God has kind of come out of the hiding? Because... It does seem beautiful to you now, and it does seem magical to you now, which it didn't a couple of years ago. So how, do you know what I mean? It's, well, I can think about God's hiddenness or God's evidence as I feel about it or think about it today, but can, I can also look at it, how I've kind of developed and uncovered or discovered God. 
We'll come back to that and hear what Alex has to say after a short break, because we take breaks here on The Unbelievable <laughs> Show. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're talking about divine hiddenness. Uh, my guest today, Lucas Ruger and Alex O'Connor. Lucas runs the Deflate YouTube channel. Alex, of course, uh, the Cosmic Skeptic. And we'll be back in just a moment. We've closed the window as well here at Wick Wickcliffe Hall where, in Oxford, where we're recording so that uh, you won't hear so many cars and trucks going by in the background. But um, we kind of had a bit of a cliffhanger there, uh, as, as Lucas asked you, Alex. Essentially, you appear to have changed your mind on some issues you you seem to take some arguments for god more seriously than you used to you and perhaps you could comment on whether you were talking seriously about the ontological argument as a as a beautiful argument that moves you in some way whereas a few years ago you were prepared to say it's not worth spending any time on so yeah first of all <laughs> is wait were you taking were you meaning that seriously and 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 does your move towards taking some of these arguments you know more seriously suggest that god may have been revealing himself to you uh, yes and no. Okay. I think the argument is beautiful. I think it's interesting and fascinating and, and, and fiercely clever. What changed your mind just, just as a, you know, diversion? Well, even though Joe was insisting that no philosopher takes this seriously. Yeah, you know? I know. It's, it's a tragedy. <laughs> um, I, I think, as I said before on my channel, it might have a lot to do with one of my friends who's doing a, a PhD in the Anselmian ontological argument and it's probably through discussing it with him you know for hours upon hours that I began to sort of take it a bit more seriously uh, but I, I really do think that and I, I don't know exactly which video it was you watched but I made a video just on the ontological argument that was maybe you know 20 2017 yeah. 2018 something like that and I actually watched that back recently and, and nearly privated it because it was so it was so bad like it, it's just it's really bad and the reason it's so bad is because i just didn't i didn't understand it i didn't get the argument and mm -hmm. it's evidenced by for instance there's a point where the video i'm responding to says that there's a premise that god exists in some possible world right mm -hmm. and i sort of said something like well you can't say that actually because you know you say that god is necessary which means he exists in either all possible worlds or no possible worlds mm -hmm. and so when you say this premise that god exists in some possible world then, you know, that can't be the case because mm. he can't exist in just some possible world. He has to exist in all or none. And this this is confusion. This is, I, I mm. didn't get why the argument was taking this form. Obviously, something had gone wrong in my head. And so, of course, at the time, I think that sounds ridiculous because, of course, saying if it's possible that God exists, then God exists mm -hmm. sounds ridiculous sure. right? if, if you don't sort of understand what the argument's driving at. And so... Okay, a lot of people have said to me, look, you you really need to revisit this. So I do, and I look at it and I think, wow, this is actually quite interesting. This is this is quite this is quite powerful. I wouldn't say that sort of God has come out from hiding here. This is an example of me misunderstanding, uh, mis misunderstanding an argument and then upon understanding it thinking that it's very clever and I don't think my view on on how good it is has changed since then. Now, you could still say well, here's still evidence of, of an argument that's put forward, which at first you say, ah, oh, that does nothing for me, it's ridiculous. And now you're saying, oh, it's quite good. But this is kind of the problem all over again, because like, sure, I just, I, I didn't understand the argument at first. Like, it's not like that was my fault. At least I don't think it was my fault. You know, I was a teenager and I was trying mm. to look at sort of the, the logic of possibilities and I just didn't get it. And so maybe part of the reason why I was an atheist back then was because I'd heard an argument like that and I thought it's ridiculous. Now, maybe that's because of my misunderstanding, but even then, even if that is the case, it's like, what could I have done there? What could I have done differently? So maybe God just has good reason to sort of allow me to be mistaken yeah. so that then in the future I become sort of a theist and then maybe it's something to do with that journey that actually sort of shows people that, you know, if they're experiencing doubts that maybe that this is something that, that happens to people. But then there are all kinds of problems that are raised by that. Um, for example, the problem of, of believing in libertarian free will as a theist if you think if you're the kind of theist that thinks that sort of my acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus is somehow necessary to my salvation, then as long as you believe that there are sort of free human beings who are actually able to do what they like, then sure, maybe God has some grand plan whereby, you know, I, I'm not a theist and then 10 years in the future I become a theist and this has some great sort of practical import. But maybe like four years into that, somebody sort of freely chooses to come and murder me. Somebody hits me with their car or something like that. And so I never actually make it that far. There seems to be a bit of a problem here for me, which is that, well, if the reason why I wasn't a theist at the moment of my death 
was because God was doing something himself, was like sort of purposefully trying to enact this plan where I eventually become a theist one day, but this gets interrupted because of the existence of free will. And so I end up going to um, go into the afterlife, not saved. Mm -hmm. That seems incredibly unfair. Okay, so maybe God sort of knows what I would have done had that not happened, in which case I kind of ask why it needed to be done at all in the first place. Um, I, I understand that this could be a this could be an argument. This could be it could be like, well, look, yeah, I know that that you you don't feel God's presence, and I know that He's not making Himself known to you, but He's doing that on purpose. Mm. It seems <clears throat> strange to me to put that in the same uh, argument or or in the same position against this problem as saying that. But look, there is all of this evidence. There is all of this natural theology that you're sort of ignoring or not understanding or rejecting. But then also saying that actually, no, the reason that you don't feel God is because God has good reason to sort of hide himself from you. These seem to rub up against each other, as well as, of course, that uh, scripture seems to be littered with references to the idea that people should be able to believe in God. You know, the fool in his heart says there is no God. Romans 1 is a famous example of people saying that this is uh, God saying that essentially the evidence that's been provided to, to everybody is such that they are without excuse for not having belief in him. Mm -hmm. I, I'm f I don't mind somebody saying, yeah, that's what Romans 1 means. And it's correct that there is enough evidence for everybody and you're just somehow missing it or ignoring it or something. Or somebody saying, you know, that there actually isn't enough evidence that's been provided to you and God has good reason for that. But I don't think you can do both at once. Okay. Yeah. That, let's have a few responses then to, to some yeah, of those thoughts. Th th there was a lot there. I think just as a, as a comment on the side, I don't know whether it makes sense for us to go in. I mean, I understand where you're coming from by saying, well, if God would allow me to kind of wrestle with, with all this stuff and all the arguments without coming to believe and the grand plan is this and that, but maybe it can get messed up. I mean, that's I guess that's a slightly different question regarding divine providence and or you know yeah. how god orders the world and all of that stuff all i was all i was trying to say is that by by looking at your own kind of development or the way you've come i mean even emotionally you yourself said you know in your recent debate with jonathan mcclatchy that a couple of years ago you you were among those resistant skeptics or non-believers who would have said or who said, well, even if I knew or believed that God existed, or the Christian God at least, I wouldn't want to worship him. Whereas now you are saying of yourself that I'd, I'd happily worship him, actually. And I would love to be the recipient of unconditional divine grace. So in, so to me, this seems to ju suggest that maybe, well, yes, there is certainly a problem of divine hiddenness. And there is certainly this, again, this intuitive perception, both Christians and non-Christians have that, well, I would like to experience God more, but he just doesn't seem to be out there. Again, I, I would like to be moved, but I just can't get there. But then maybe there is also the sense of, well, maybe that there is, there is the, the role you yourself play in, in hiding from God. You know what I mean? By saying, well, again, back then, I didn't want to worship God, even if I knew that he existed. Whereas now, again, in this sense, I'm saying, well, maybe you yourself have come out of the hiding, if that's kind of a proper use of terms. And again, I understand that you you might say, well, what, like, was, what was my fault back then for thinking uh, about God or thinking about worshiping God that way, uh, but and yet again, I would say that well, this is this is the, the this gets in, in gets us into a discussion about free will and yeah. And I, like I mean, just just for the record, in that sense, Alex, mm. do, do when you say you're a non-resistant, do you, uh, I mean, at one time, would you have said as as Lucas seems to be saying that actually you would have said no if if God is there, especially the Christian God, I wouldn't want to worship that God, and I would in a sense, I, I you acknowledged your resistance. <laughs> um, you in a different place now and and then the, the next question i suppose is how could you even tell that because you know most of our psychology and motivations aren't often open to us anyway how yeah. would you know that you are genuinely non-resistant and, and and so on but go that's ahead. true um of course, of course no one can have full confidence that they know what they would actually do in a situation so grand as being faced with god i think it would take a, a rather brave atheist indeed or i guess they wouldn't be an atheist anymore to you know re re reject what if christianity is true just sort of would be morally mm. justifiable and true on on grounds that you somehow have better epistemic access to ethics 
um, which you may indeed have none at all if, if you have nothing to ground it in. Um, I think it's quite strange. I, I think, yeah, look, I was, I was quite sort of wrapped up in not just the theism is false, but also theism is terrible and horrible and needs to be eliminated because it's just this disgusting, tyrannical force. Um, Anti-theism. Yeah, more or less. You, you end up kind of joining a team, right? And and if you if you start making YouTube videos, as I did, about atheism, and you say, this is why I think, you know, that, that, that there might be no God, and then you find other people doing the same thing, but you find that a lot of them are sort of saying that religion is really bad and very evil, this is just kind of what happens to people if you if you start listening to a certain form of content. It's it's quite strange as well because it's usually a, a peripheral things. So it's why you find it quite strange that if you know somebody's views on one thing, you can often work out what their views are on something else. If I know your views on abortion, I might be able to work out your views on gun rights. You know, it's like why is that? Well, maybe it's because there's there's sort of something on the periphery, um, and it's not it's not always so direct. It's just because if you're listening to somebody who's super super pro-life in america and you listen to loads and loads of pro-life sources like i don't know something about the algorithm or something yeah, about the yeah, guests yeah, they have yeah, on just oh, totally yeah, something yeah, just yeah, just yeah yeah it and and without even noticing you just start slowly sort of accepting this this pro-gun rhetoric and the same thing happens with theism and atheism right if you become an atheist on the periphery there's this sociological critique of religion which i was quite swept up in um i'm i'm remain agnostic now on the usefulness of religion. I've said before that I think saying religion is bad is like saying politics is bad. It's like, mm. yeah, but that doesn't really tell us very much. I mean, it, most Christians would probably think that religion of many forms is quite bad, sure. right? And so it, it's quite it's quite vague. Mm. Um, but I certainly wouldn't say that like it would be a bad thing for there to be something like a Christian God who existed. And 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 so the next question: How do you? How certain are you that you are non-resistant? That that if God is there, then you're not putting up any barriers. Well, um, I suppose as certain as I can be to give you a, a rather boring answer, uh, there's, there's a kind of, there's something that needs to be worked out here in terms of how hard a person needs to try. If I did mm. nothing, if I just kind of sat around and said, look, you know, God, come, come and find me, maybe you'd say, look, you, you, you need to do a bit of searching. Yeah. But I don't think I could be expected to sort of be you know, on my knees multiple times a day, like begging high heavens to give me a sign um, or to, to dedicate my entire life to studying philosophy and theology, even though, of course, I have actually ended up doing that, which is why I say I think I've actually gone, although I'm not sure exactly sort of how much I should be expected to sort of to do, I think I've gone further than wherever that line may be. But of course, you can do this stuff with the wrong sort of heart, as it were, like you can go into studying a, a degree in theology with the express purpose of trying to undermine it or something like that, which, you know, may well have been sort of what was running through my head at the beginning of the degree. I'm, I'm not sure it's actually quite hard to remember. But certainly now, I think to myself, look, I, I, I live with Christians, and I, I made that decision purposefully. Mm -hmm. To, to try to consistently engage them as people who are my friends. So not in like a debate, not where you're trying to one-up each other in front of an audience, but where you just sit down and have a conversation with your friends. You know, I read scripture. I go to Bible study groups and this kind of thing. I, I You do I'm, more than many Christians do, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I try my best. I mean, I still, I still, I still don't do, do as, much as, I, as much as I could, you know? Like I, yes. I, there, no, there, there are books enough, of the but, Bible that I haven't read, yeah, you know, this, yeah. this kind of thing. But, but I think, look, I can't put my finger on this, yeah. but I feel like I'm doing okay. what would be expected. So, so as your conscience is clean, that as far as you know, within reason, you're 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 looking, searching. You're you're you don't think that you've got a kind of axe get to grind against God at this mm. point. Um, and and okay, and and I think we just have to take that at face value, Lucas. Yeah, right? I I I very much think so. Yes, I, even I if don't... you don't believe me, you can just imagine that there's no, at I least do. one person who who does act like sure. that. Sure. No, I do, and I mean in general, I mean you're not the first person who tells me that. You know, I I'm really trying, and I would I would love for there to be a God, and I try to touch base with Him. And again, I read Scripture, and I go to Bible studies, and I pray, or I listen to worship music, and whatnot. Yes, I do take that at face value. It's not, you know, to. I I feel quite awkward saying, well, maybe there's something psychological going on. Other than by, well, the, the only thing that I would have to admit is, is that, well, even with me, there is psychological stuff going on as a Christian. You know, I would want, I too want Christianity to be true. There is, I do 
you know, there are underlying reasons why I do certain Christian things, which I'm unaware of. And I thought it was quite interesting in your, um, you know, you quoted, I think to Jonathan, you quoted uh, Psalm 133, uh, 139, yeah. which is about the presence of God. Where can I go from you? And you, if I make myself, you know, if, if I go to the ends of the earth, you are there and whatnot. And the, the Psalm ends with the Psalmist saying, well, oh God, search my heart, oh God, and know, know my thoughts yes. you know try me mm. and see if there's any grievous way within me and lead me in the way everlasting and you know in between that end and the beginning which you quote there's this really messy three verses where he talks about you know i hate those who hate you and it's just you feel like wow what's going on here and then it ends on this note where the psalmist himself it's as if he becomes aware that he may not be fully in control of what is actually going on. And I think that's why it's so important that scripture mentions, well, you know, that's, that Paul mentions in Romans that we should be renewed in our minds. Because again, we, we seem to be not quite, not always quite aware of, of why we're doing things. And the roots of decision making go very, very deep into depths that we, you know, that we can't grasp. So in this sense, I like, yes, I would definitely say, well, you know, what, what, what you say, Alex, you know, you've tried your best. And yes, I do think you've come to great lengths with all your studies and, and interactions and whatnot. Yes, I, I don't think that there is, I don't think it's fair for me to say, well, you know, maybe there is, you know, something else going on. Um, but but are, you, are you, are you ultimately coming to the view, Lucas, that no one can ultimately know then there might still be it's always possible that there is some kind of resistance within any individual because I, we can't know I, I do think and but again if if i was going to say that to alex i was only going to say by by also adding that well i'm in that same yeah, we're boat. all in the same you boat know, I'm yeah, in that same yeah boat. i think you might be yeah. committed to that view but it's it's certainly not something i take personally it, it's yeah. quite a, it's quite a powerful rhetorical tool actually mm -hmm. if you're debating somebody and they say well look are you sure you're sort of searching properly and it's how dare you i've done this i've done that you know and you start reeling things off as if it's not possible to do these things as i say for the purpose of undermining them i mean look i, I my job yeah. is to discuss religion mm -hmm. broadly at least one part of it and and to do it from a critical aspect so it's like well of <laughs> course you've sort of read gospels and and live with christians to get an idea of how they think so that you can better sort of undermine them this kind of thing like it's possible a person can do that i don't think that's what i'm doing i really yeah. don't but but i understand why uh somebody might be committed to the view that that's what i'm doing at least in some part it doesn't mean that i'm sort of knowingly mm. uh, uh sort of deceiving everybody i know and myself it, it, there might just be sort of a more subtle motivation at play but of course I don't think you're you're exactly even in control of those motivations. That it's it's complicated because you know there's this there's a sense in which there's also a sort of atheistic uh, vested interest that that goes into sort of wanting to sin. Christians often say you know atheists just want to sin. I mean this is this is true. Of course it's true. Even well, from well, a Christian is, picture, is everybody this, wants to is sin. Is this the right? view? If I could put it this way, that some Christians may say, well it's not just about changing a belief it's about changing a lifestyle and yes. therefore there's going to be a psychological sort of cost uh, and a social cost to becoming a christian therefore that's bound to weigh on whether an atheist ultimately decides to cross that's right. that line and it's often implied that to experience the fullness of faith you need to walk the walk that mm -hmm. is god will reveal himself once you start living a pious life um we're sort of often told that like if you live the life of a christian then you might start right. feeling if you if you act it out now. then it might start to but this, suddenly this become to me real is no surprise this is mm. just how human psychology works i'm sure mm. that if i started going to masjid and praying five times a day and hanging out with my muslim friends all of the time and and reading muslim literature all the time i'd probably become a little I, my credence in islam would probably be increased similarly if i got you to sort of hang out with nobody but vegans for the next month and read nothing but vegan literature and watch factory farm footage i mean just going to lunch with you i practically came out <laughs> as a vegan alex so yeah. you know you're probably gonna it's probably gonna increase your credence right this is how human psychology works and so it's no surprise to me that if i were to start living the life of a christian i'd probably start finding a bit more plausible fine but it has to be the other way around here. Of course, yeah. there, there, are, there are some, there are sins and then there are sins, right? There are, there are sins that even just in a sort of colloquial sense, you know, I'm not saying that I'm going to keep going around like murdering people, but I mean, there are certain things that are considered sins, which can really maybe only be made sense of as sins 
if you've already accepted the truth of Christianity. These, it's difficult to, to put my finger on it. It might include things, it might include things like lying in certain circumstances, or it might include like casual sex, mm. or, um, uh, you know, th th things of this sort, which are, which people might engage in and think, not just think, well, I know this is a bit sinful, but I'm not a Christian, but thinking, I just don't see anything wrong with this mm -hmm. unless maybe Christianity is true. And even then, I'm not sure quite why it's wrong, but yeah. I guess I'd be willing I'm, to accept I mean, that. The, uh, the, the, the person that's often quoted on this, Lucas, and Alex, you're probably familiar with this, is, is Thomas Nagel. There's a famous passage in yeah. one of his books where he says, the thing is, I don't want it to be true. Um, you know, and I'm troubled by the number of intelligent people I know who do believe in God and Christianity and so on. And and, and that's often used to say, well, look, you know, there's obviously a kind of motivational bias going on very often in, in, in this. And yeah. and Alex, you know, hearing what Alex has to say there, does that help at all, Lucas, in, in the kind of sense of could could those kinds of, you know, well, I, I want to be able to have sex who I want with, you know, and, and not sort of follow some sp specific biblical code. Is that going to make a difference in your view to whether people actually are open? Well, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I definitely think there are those kinds of people who to whom this plays a big role. I mean, Thomas Nagel called this the cosmic authority problem. And he said, I think it's quite pervasive and quite like bears quite a bit of the responsibility for the reductionism of our time. That's how he ends, mm. how the quote ends. And he was kind of being very honest yeah. in, that, in that sort of moment, wasn't he? In Definitely. And then that. there is Aldous Huxley, who, who, I mean, who made specific reference to sexual morality. He said, that well, you know, the the liberation from the meaning that Christianity is supposed to give were was for many of of those in our generation, a way to have a more sexually liberal lifestyle. So, so yes, I definitely do do think that this is the case with some people. I mean, I, I've had people come to me and say that you know I I knew that Christianity is true, or uh, I mean, people from from a Muslim background who went into New Age and just crazy crazy stories. They, they felt they, that God supernaturally revealed them himself to them actually and so this girl came to me and said well Lucas I knew Christianity to be Christianity to be true way before I actually committed to Christ but it's because I exactly I was aware of of the cost that was required in terms of my sexual lifestyle that I didn't want to commit so I do think yes there are those people but again I, I, it, it, as far as I you know, as far as I know you, Alex, I, I, again, that's why I, I, I'm very apprehensive to say, well, you know, maybe there is some of this going on underneath the surface. Yeah. Well, I, I don't I, think I mean, that's I can, fair. I can tell you that there, there is to to a degree, which is, as I say, only in those areas that where I might be engaging in things which would be sinful if Christianity were true. But yeah. it's difficult to make sense of being wrong if there is no sort of moral authority. Um not not to imply so I, I gave the example of casual sex i think that casual mm -hmm. sex is is quite a quite a dangerous thing it's quite an overrated thing it's like people don't treat it as seriously as they should but mm. equally in other contexts treat it like way more seriously than anything else on planet earth it's quite strange that it's sort of everything and nothing at the same time it's a difficult thing to sort of make sense of but certainly like you know sex before marriage or or if um or if i were homosexual right engaging in homosexual sexual activity or even just homosexual you know relationship it would be the kind of thing where I'd think to myself, well, look, if Christianity were true and for some reason this was wrong and I wouldn't understand why, look, Christianity is such a wonderful, incredible, like just, just eternity altering thing that sure, I, I'll happily You'd just be happy just to give, give it up. up. But, it's, mm -hmm. but if somebody's like, yeah, you need to walk the walk and then it will become revealed to you. It's like, and until, until I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much certain that that's the case. It's going to be very difficult for me to justify yeah, giving the giving cost that isn't up, going to be know? worth the yeah. Yeah. potential benefit. And that's that's that unlike may may you know if there. if somebody's yeah. like sort of engaging in uh, sinful activity that sort of uh, maybe they're like a, a drunkard or something and they think to themselves, well, if there's no God, there's not exactly a reason why this should be like wrong per se. But they they sort of feel there's something off about that, right? These kind of things, it's a bit easier to say. Well, look, if you start sort of living a bit more piously then then christianity will will reveal itself to you but with these kinds of things it, it seems it seems more difficult for me yeah and i don't i don't i don't think it's right to say that well unless you walk the walk that god won't reveal himself to you i mean there's people who have who felt you know god's presence or experienced something even supernatural even without having walked the walk whereby i mean i would say by sheer grace god did reveal himself and they felt something without having done anything, without having committed to anything uh, prior to that experience. Um, 
I mean, I'd like to, uh, I don't know if this, this is going to be helpful, but I'd like to kind of throw in Paul Draper's perspective on this. I thought it was a very interesting, I don't know what you think about it, Alex. He, I mean, he's, of course, the state-of-the-art example of an agnostic who sits on the fence, who says that, well, you know, the evidence really ju just points both ways, and I can't make up my mind whether it's naturalism or theism. And yet he goes on to say in one of his essays, he, he says, well, I think as an agnostic who does sit exactly on the, fa on the fence, it is, and he uses the term rationally required for me to engage in religious activity, prayer or scripture reading or what have you. And then he goes on to say that this may actually, and here's an important distinction I think we, or he causes us to make. Um, he says, well, this may actually lead to a relationship with God even if it doesn't lead to belief in God. And I think, I mean, these are some, like we were talking about belief and ex like relationship or about these things in a technical term. I mean, if belief is, you know, this propositional attitude of holding something to be true or to be the case, he says, well, you can have relationship with God even if you don't have that propositional attitude of belief. But or what other people would say, it, like acceptance, that is acting as if something is true mm. may actually lead to relationship to God. And maybe the, uh, the the kind of the difference between the two is, again, belief, belief is what, what we mean by that, at least philosophically speaking, is again, you hold something to be true. Whereas acting as if something is true, that is acceptance, is quite a different ballgame. I mean, you can accept something even if you don't believe in it let's say your brother is kidnapped and you feel you know you have good evidence that he was also killed but because of the great good that it would be for him to still live and for you to be reunited with him you act as if it's true that he's still alive so you go and, and search for him or you do whatever campaigning you need to do in order to try and find him so you act as if as if as if it's true that your brother lives even though you don't actually believe that he lives yeah and and so Draper is kind of making making this case that you can, because it for him, it is still a real possibility that God does exist. He says, well, I think it's a good thing for me to act as if this is true. And he goes on to say that this may actually, it, it, it can lead to relationship with God, provided that God exists. Of course, if God doesn't exist, if he turns out to not exist, well, there is not going to be any relationship. But I can act as if it's true that he exists. And if he happens to exist, I can develop it's, it's relationship. It's almost a bit of a Pascal's wager, almost, it, isn't it? It goes in a bit into that. And then he goes on to say that, and so this is uh, like, I like I want to say this cautiously to you, Alex, because I know of the great efforts you've, you've done already. He says that, well, maybe for some people, belief may not actually be the primary gateway to relationship with God. But some people, because again, of our different psychological wirings, we some of us may actually have to struggle and to wrestle and to be satisfied at first with acting as if it's true that god exists mm. and get into a relationship with him that way instead of and, entering and, through and, belief and, already and, 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 uh, as you've said there are many christians i think who struggle yes. with doubt who who say my belief in god goes up and down all the time but i i live you know but i have to just live this life where actually i believe that whether or not i'm feeling yes. at this moment that god exists I just i'm going to trust that yes. god exists and and so on so so belief is sometimes a bit of a difficult thing to say well that's what it is and that's what means god is is there or has revealed himself to you there may be i guess on what lucas is saying some sense in which you you may not even have a belief in god but still there's a possibility of some kind of relationship with god in even in the absence of that belief yeah but this is what i was talking about a moment ago which is we have to offer an analysis of what it means to sort of live as if as if this were true yeah. because okay so i can live as if it were true that i should love my enemies and that i should be compassionate and that sort of love is the basic truth of the universe okay but that doesn't seem uh that doesn't seem adequate to live as if christianity were true it would also uh mean that I would have to stop committing these things which I described earlier as sort of sins if Christianity were true, things which I can only even conceptually begin to understand as in any way wrong if Christianity is already true. And so if we're saying something like, well, look, as an agnostic, maybe a good idea is to live as if this is true, because then if it is true, you know, you manage to enter into this relationship even without the belief. 
then it gets only worse because now you'd be asking me, for instance, if I were gay to give up homosexual relationships, mm. not even because then I'll be able to finally believe in God. But no, you still won't. You still won't believe any of it. It's true. But you'll still be sort of living this life as if it's true in the hopes that one day mm. maybe the fact that you've entered into a relationship with a being who isn't sort of willing to to demonstrate that he's even in that relationship I, with you. I mean, you. I, I guess... The, I, I feel like that would be a lot to yeah. ask of a person. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I, a, I suppose the question isn't though whether it's a lot to ask of a person, but whether it in principle could be the case that people who say I haven't had God revealed to me could nevertheless still be in a relationship with God. I suppose it's just asking... Are there people? Is it? Is there a scenario in which actually yeah. the belief has to be there? That's in order true. For God but if, to if be... the kind of resistance involved in making somebody be best described as like a resistant non-believer, or, or, or somehow sort of not into, a, not in a relationship with God because of so, something that they're doing, if that something that they're doing is something like an unwillingness to give up a very important part of their life that they can't see as wrong or sinful until they've already accepted the truth of the proposition. I don't think that's fair. I, I think that that's, I think that that's quite cruel. I, 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 I don't know what you, what you. I, I'm not exactly sure exactly what the kind of point you're trying to put forward is. But if I try to sort of trace this conversation, mm -hmm. it was something like we were talking about. You know, there there are sort of motivations for for believing one way or the other. You know, and one of the atheist motivations might be that they just want to sin. And as I said a moment ago, like I do think that's true because everybody wants to sin. That's the problem of sin. That's for Christians. The whole thing is that everybody wants to sin so much that they unavoidably do. Um, okay, so I say, well, maybe it's because. You know, there are, but then there are certain sins which are only sins really if Christianity is true. And it would be weird to ask me to sort of give those up yeah. and then maybe, you know, I'll, I'll achieve this Christianity thing. And then it seems like Lucas said, well, no, I'm, I'm not saying that you need to sort of walk the walk and then God reveals himself to you. But maybe if you sort of do walk the walk, you'll be able to enter into a relationship with him without even knowing it. It's like, is that what you're recommending people like me do? Is that, are you just making that like a conceptual point that it's like possible to enter into a relationship? Because if you're saying that this is what someone in my position should do, then I think you're probably asking too much of me. We'll, we'll have a response and then we'll have to start to wrap it up, guys. Yeah. Well, I was, the, the point I was trying to make with regards to God revealing himself as soon as someone starts to walk the walk, what, what I'm, maybe that wasn't clear enough or I was being too simplistic. I do think that in certain cases, this may be the case, but I, I, I reacted against the claim that this is how it works. B because again, I think God interacts with different people in different ways. So it, it can be that someone, that he'll ask of someone, if if you want, to, to walk the walk first or to act as if Christianity is true before he lets them feel something or or, or uh, like have an experience of him in this sense. Whereas for other people, it will be the case that, you know, he lets them feel something or have an experience of the divine uh, before they, they've, they've done anything really. So this is, this is not for me to know or to judge like what case applies to what person, what I am. And I'm also not saying... <clears throat> And I think this is, I mean, because of my theological commitments, I would never say that if you just accept, again, in the technical sense, Christianity, that is, you act as if it's true without believing and you get into a relationship with God, well, this will be enough. I do think, I mean, uh, I wouldn't be comfortable holding that position. I mean, the scripture does say that in the end, it's it's faith that saves. So there is, and to faith, there is certainly a belief component. You know, it's, it's certainly trust in Christ or trust in the truth of Christianity, trust in God. But with that comes a belief component that is, well, I yeah, at least belief I hold to be true that God exists and that 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 Christ is you know was was revealed in the flesh. So I'm not saying that acceptance acting as if something acting as if Christianity is true is going to be the end of the road. I do I, what what I'm trying to say is that for some people, and again, that's why I'm saying I don't want this to sound too harsh on you personally. I, I do think that for some people, this may be the way to go, or this may be the thing, kind of the, the leap of faith that God is asking someone to take before he lets them experience him in the sense that, well, you know, even if you're saying, well, there are certain sins that are only considered sins, if I accept Christianity to be true, well, maybe and again, I mean, this is very hypothetical. I don't want to kind of uh, under the surface point, try to point my finger at anything, not at all. But maybe what God is asking a person like you to, to take the leap of faith and say, and, and say, well, I actually let go of this. And I truly act as if Christianity is true. I truly kind of take on 
the Christian proposition that this stuff is not is is not good and I ought not to do it. You know what I mean? So this is yeah, but that, there that, may that be does... th th this may be that kind of uh, the leap of faith. Uh, you know that applies to to, to, to yeah. To, to, I, I mean, to we'll... and also let me just point out yeah. that I, I've you know that I find it significant that you have there is this wrestling with God, like a theme of wrestling with God or with the divine. That, that you find in scripture. It's Jacob who wrestles with God and is called Israel, one of the meanings of which is, well, the one who, who, who struggles and wrestles with God. It's, there is this line you find in scripture, this threat of people not finding God directly through, oh, wow, this all makes sense. You know, the evidence is crystal clear to me. Yes, sure, I'll be happy to commit. And, and I, I, they may even have had an experience or whatnot. There is this thread of other people not really finding God that way, but just really struggling yeah. with it. We we will go to um, the final break, and and we'll 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 conclude our conversation in just a moment. Alex, yeah, I, I mean, as we start to conclude this conversation, uh, we talked about you know the fact that you feel you are genuinely open, as open as you can be. Luke is still saying, but you know, sometimes the journey of faith is not just about. God revealing himself to people, but it's about some long, you know, struggle with God. And, and ultimately you only see, you know, the big picture in the end and, and so on. And, and, and who knows, maybe, maybe that is just the way it is for some people and, and that they're not going to be given, you know, this clear evidence that they feel their owed if there is a God out there. And, and ultimately it might involve something like, as he says, you know, a, a kind of trying on of Christianity, you know, a leap of faith that, that, that is costly at some level, but, but for some reason, that's part of what God intends for you in the end. So yeah, where, where do you go with all that? I don't like to think of divine hiddenness as a response to theism as much as I like to think of theism as a response to divine hiddenness. Mm. I think that on an atheistic picture of the universe of consciousness essentially arising by accident, we don't sort of know what we're doing here. We developed this faculty for asking why because it's somehow beneficial. And we sort of look at the night sky and we look at the stars and we look at the, the, the grandiosity of the whole thing and we say, look, what, what's going on here? And there's, there's nothing, there's no answer, there's no indication, there's no, there's no reason for it. And so like, you know, existential dread isn't something that was you know, invented by, by the existentialists, something that probably preceded all religious thought and may have been one of the reasons why it developed. It's not surprising to me, in other words, to find religious scripture littered with people struggling with their inability to find God. And only after a sort of long series of intellectual and practical sacrifice are they able to discover him. Maybe that is what it takes, but maybe that says more about faith than it does about the person. Maybe, yeah, it is the case that, okay, speaking poetically, what God asks of me to reveal himself to me is that I essentially throw caution to the wind and just begin to act like a Christian. And that's not true of everybody. That's just true of someone like me, maybe. Mm -hmm. Now, why, why might that be the case? Well, maybe because for somebody else, natural theology is enough to make them go, you know what? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think I'm going to be a Christian now. Okay, fine. And that person's perfectly content because now they're, they're, they're happy, they have an explanation, that they have a sort of meaning in their life, sure. And for someone like me, I, I look at these arguments and I think, yeah, they make sense, but they're just kind of not doing it for me. So somebody says, well, maybe it's because you're resistant. It's like, okay, sure. So then you try to be as non-resistant as possible. You try to engage in sort of Christian literature and debate and argument, even if you're not living like a Christian, but you're being non-resistant at, at the very least. And then you still feel nothing. And someone comes along and says, okay, well, then why don't you just try sort of acting as if it were true, right? You've tried sort of being convinced, but you weren't. Now you've tried being sort of obsessively open about being convinced and it hasn't worked. Now be so obsessively open that you're just going to actually pretend as if it's true and just act as if it's true. And then, then maybe, you know, you'll, you'll start to see it as true. It's like, well, no surprise. But to me, this seems like a big cope. This seems like looking at the universe, receiving absolutely no answer, not understanding why we're here and palpably tripping over ourselves to try to make something like this work to to make ourselves feel mm. better about ourselves mm. and I, I hate to downplay it so much but mm. this is unfortunately just the sort of atheistic view of what religion is it's a mm. now that's not to say now a lot of people say that that makes it a bad thing 
there's there's obviously a reason why this is developed there's obviously a reason why this is sort of universally sprung up among human cultures maybe not sort of religion or theism per se but some sort of feeling of transcendence or numinous like it obviously serves some kind of purpose right and of course that can be perverted into becoming a, a horrible tool for social injustice or whatever but like you know in principle that there's obviously something that this does for the for mm. the human soul mm. um but as I say, I, th I think we've kind of got it the wrong way around. It's not like we have this thing called theism and we're saying, here's here's this thing that lots of people believe, but like, oh, well, here's a problem that we hadn't thought of. Why why is God not, a, not, not sort of making himself evident to us? I think it's the other way around. We have, we have this kind of mm. emptiness and nihilism and suffering and meaninglessness, which, you know, it, it helps to believe in a God. And that, that desire is so fundamental, is so sort of deep within a human being it's sort of almost pre-intellectual that uh, of course we're going to be able to try all different kind of tricks to make this work for us and so i I, and I also don't think it's surprising you know a lot of people say i'm very troubled by the fact that there are lots of very smart people who believe this kind of stuff for a start a lot of those smart people are sort of really smart scientists or incredible poets and writers and musicians and they all believe in god it's like Okay, you can you can have incredible intelligence in one area and just be totally unknowledgeable about another, but also incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. philosophers. But as I say, even then, I don't think like philosophy is the most appropriate mechanism to God if there is in fact a God. Like, sure, these people are academics and they sort of wear shirts and suits and they show up to debates and they bring their books and you know all this kind of stuff. But when they get home and take off their clothes and get in the shower, they're still just like a confused ape who you know wants comfort <laughs> from the universe that's giving them absolutely no reason. As to why they should be getting out of bed in the morning so it's no surprise to me that mm -hmm. you know all of this development of course like the very development of intellectual thought and writing books and having conversations all of that kind of stuff is itself a, an outgrowth of something that a, about doing that that's going to help us to survive or make us sort of socially more beneficial and so if religion is in the same category it wouldn't surprise me that people are sort of that underneath there somewhere there's 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 something about this longing for some answer that, that yeah. causes them to invent right. these kind of deities and defend them to the ends of the earth. Well, we've, we've gone back about 100,000 years there with, <laughs> with that uh, conclusion from Alex. Where, where do you want to begin? Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate your thoughts there. I think the, the question here as well, is it possible to take kind of the scenario you presented or the narrative you presented a step back by saying, I mean, you're essentially saying, so theism is an answer or a response to hiddenness you know, the hiddenness of meaning or the, 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 the lack of meaning we seem to see ourselves confronted with. Well, but then the question is also, well, why do we sense that in the first place? You know, why, if there was no meaning to the universe, why did we even find, you know, the, this, this piece of meaning that the universe is meaningless? So I guess the, the, the question then becomes, well, what do you take to be ultimate? Or where do you start your narrative? Is it, you know, do you feel, well, you know, we, 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 we came up with theism on, and with philosophy and poetry and all of that in response to what you could call divine hiddenness or meaninglessness? Or is the fact that we're actually asking these questions not a pointer to, you know, the truth that there is actually meaning to be found? Because otherwise, why, like, why again would we have come up with, you know, why would we have come up with 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 this meaningful view or proposition that there is no meaning in the first place that, that that's one thing i would say in response and the other thing i would say is again i think or i want to challenge you not to be too hard i don't know not too hard on yourself or on god for that matter for saying well there is no answer because i do think that you in some ways your journey testifies to the fact that you have found certain answers or at least certain answers have started to to maybe click more or to uh, to make more sense. And then I guess, and that's maybe a good note to end on, like I, I wonder on your behalf, like, okay, how long, oh Lord, like as the Psalmist says in Psalm 13, you know, how long will you hide from me? And that's an answer, I mean, I cannot give. I can certainly see that there is, and again, this may sound super like patronizing or uh, like harsh to hear it from me, but I can certainly see that there is with your struggle and people, I mean, thousands of people, kind of test if like witnessing it i mean there is like immense good i believe that comes out for people who are forced to think about their lives much more deeply and think about god for that matter mm. and christianity for that matter much more deeply and so i understand that this sounds like well you know you're you're being sacrificed here on the altar <laughs> of people finding meaning and a deeper 
uh, you know, sense of faith or experience of God. But there may be, I, I just wonder whether this may be mm. some kind of some aspect to the journey yeah. you're I, on. I mean, maybe you're the next Apostle Paul, you know, and it's your <laughs> your you wonderful go. conversion straight after this show, uh, Alex. Which yeah, well, finally, you know, <laughs> all, all I'm asking for is something just like what Paul experienced. I, I tell you, Justin, if, if, if I experience even just in the form of a flash of light, like, like St. Paul, although, you know, dubious circumstances, I have to say, but even something just like that, just once, just mm -hmm. one time, mm. listen, here I am. And then gone. I, I could I could live on that for the rest of my entire life. Just just because a lot of people say, well, one reason why God is hiding Himself is because if He made Himself, you know, constantly present in your life, it'd like have be like having a father figure yeah. staring over your shoulder. I agree, but I'm I'm not asking for God to mm -hmm. sort of hold my hand through this lived experience. I'm asking once, okay. just and not even not even for like an overwhelming religious experience with a big waterfall and you know <laughs> I fall to my knees, but just just enough to form a belief that he exists if i can have just that just once mm. then i'll become the most prolific christian okay. apologist that you've ever met you heard it here um, <laughs> Lu lucas and uh, and alex thank you it's been a really really interesting conversation um and i hope you've enjoyed watching it wherever you're watching from well we just thought we'd record a bit of a postscript to this discussion between lucas and alex because we're here in wycliffe hall uh, it's part of oxford university it's a theological college uh, and the person who kindly helped us to arrange being here in this room is Max Baker Hitch, uh, who is a tutor both at Wycliffe and for OCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. So, uh, Max, thank you very much for organising mm -hmm. this and Thanks, helping Justin. us out. Um, yeah, of course. It's been great to have you. And I think the last time, actually, funnily enough, I had Alex in person in a studio. You were opposite him. Uh, That's right. You, you may remember that. The argument from reason, was it, Alex, we were debating? Yeah, I think I was I was woefully <laughs> unprepared. Um, I don't think so. I think It, was, it, it looked very good. Debate. It was a good looking discussion yeah, absolutely um, um, no i did i did very much enjoy it but i can't believe that's the last time that, that we, it feels like so yeah, long ago pre-pandemic that was yeah yeah long time ago um mm. anyway um uh you were on the other side of the camera mm. taking some notes and i uh, just wonder what you yeah what you made of how the argument went yeah re we really enjoyed the discussion i think um so the yeah the way alex was framing the divine hiddenness problem was very much in terms of you know well what would you expect to see in the world if there were the kind of loving God that Christianity describes? Um, and, um, you know, one of the things you might not expect to see, um, I guess, in the way Alex was framing it, is that there would be people who really are kind of earnestly uh, seeking God and um, trying their very best to be diligent about looking at the, the arguments on both sides and, and kind of opening themselves up, maybe even trying prayer and seemingly not finding uh, God. And so, um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, you could see this argument as posing a dilemma for theists. On the one hand, you, you either have to say, well, really, everyone deep down is resistant to God. Um, and it's just that we're not very good at introspecting our own psychology and telling what's kind of going on. We, we deceive ourselves. Um, but really everyone is deep down um, resisting God. Or you can say, well, no, actually, let's grant that there really are people who are genuinely non-resistant. They really would like to have a relationship with God and it's not their fault. But God has some good reasons for letting them be in this state. Um, and, th and then you kind of go on to offer what you might see as basically a type of theodicy. Mm. Um, and so I think it's fair to say we, um, that Alex and Lucas in the discussion focus quite a lot on the first horn of that dilemma. Yeah, what, whether we can actually know that we're truly yeah. open rather than granting mm -hmm. that, that some people maybe are, and, but God may have reasons for not, yeah. for not showing himself to them. Yeah, exactly. And so... and obviously quite a bit of the discussion focused on you know the case of Alex and um, his own experience of of feeling you know sincerely like he he is trying um, to be open to God's existence um, I think something Alex was saying about the the kind of means by which God would want people to come to relationship in him was really interesting so I think he put it in terms of you know natural theology um it's really interesting for those who have the time and you know the 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 luxury of of kind of thinking about these sometimes quite arcane arguments but surely wouldn't god want people to come to him through religious experience and prayer and so on and and i think you know i i, I definitely get that 
Uh, one one thing to throw out there is um, there's a philosopher called C. Stephen Evans who's tried to make the case that you could see natural theology and religious experience as not uh, being so disconnected from each other. And he suggests that actually at the root of the different kind of major natural theological arguments, cosmological, design, moral, and so on, is actually some kind of primordial experience. Mm. Um, so, for example, he talks about cosmic, this sense of cosmic wonder that he thinks most people probably have at some point in their lives where they just kind of think, gosh, isn't it weird that there is a universe? What, mm. what, there doesn't seem to have to be a universe, but there is. And doesn't that cry out for some kind of deeper mm. explanation? And, and, so, and, and so he does the same for, for the other arguments as well. And so th that's all just by way of saying maybe there is a way to see natural theology and religious experience as more connected. Yes. Um, There's a kind of intuition there and which yeah. God may mm -hmm. be using to reveal himself to people. And, and even if Alex personally hasn't been moved in, you know, all the way mm -hmm. by, by those kinds of arguments. But yeah, that, that's interesting. Alex, do you, do you want to respond to, to that idea that natural theology might be something by which God does directly reveal himself to yeah, people? Uh, it's certainly possible. Yeah. It's all, it's all, it's all possible, mm. right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, this is how theodicy, I think, tends to work is kind of saying, well, look, I mean, it's possible that this mm -hmm. is going on. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I, I suppose. Um, I, I think it's certainly true that a lot of natural theology may be some kind of result of cosmic wonder. That is, we try to sort of syllogize what is essentially just a fascinating intuition. Um, not long ago, I went to see a dramatization of the Gospel of Mark, after which mm. I met, I was with some friends, and most of them Christians, and uh, I, I met this girl there who... I just said something like, oh, well, look, are you, are you interested in philosophy? And she said, not not really. You know, I don't, I, the, the whole sort of argument thing, like putting it into premises, I can never quite find a way to like mm. put into words what it is that I'm mm. feeling. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. And as we were talking, I looked over at two of my friends and they're a bit more into the whole natural theology thing. And they were, they were having this fierce debate mm -hmm. and their, their, their faces were scrunched up and they were sort of <laughs> tapping the table and, and saying, I don't know what they were arguing about, but you know, if you, but if you take that view, then you've essentially assumed consequentialism, which completely undermines the original premise. That we said. And, I was, and after sort of talking to this guy, I looked over at them and I just thought, yeah, surely there's, there's something about it, which just felt yeah. like that's not, if there's something no. that it's all yeah. about, it's yeah. not, it's not that, you know? I, I so, get that. But, but I, so I, I feel that. like, yeah, there is the, the, the mm -hmm. what, what under, I think this almost works in, in favor of what I was trying to get across, which is something like the idea that it's natural theology is just a way of human beings trying to sort of make sense of and try to, I guess, legitimize something mm. that is essentially just an intuitive feeling of like, Wow! Well, what? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm very sympathetic to that. I would say I think that cuts both ways, though, um, because I think actually uh, the the naturalist philosopher W. V. O. Quine once said that he he was basically talking about why he's a naturalist, mm. and he said I have a preference for desert landscapes. So I think um, there's a um, <laughs> something interesting there as well about how actually is it is our choice of worldview at some level more about just this more holistic almost aesthetic sense of how it all kind of hangs together mm. in our minds and, and actually the arguments that when we try and work out the fine details those aren't the things that move us sure. um, and, I, and so I'm sympathetic to what you're saying Alex. I, I just think it can also be true of yeah, naturalism yeah. any other thoughts on, on yeah, yeah. What, what came out in the discussion so one other thought I think um would be it was really interesting when Alex was talking about um, the w what could take someone from essentially sort of propositional belief in God or, or at least some kind of credence that's creeping up above fifty percent to relationship with God and I totally agree that there is a there's a gap there that has to be bridged somehow and um, yeah this this thing about you know um, why an argument does or doesn't move me. Um, and yeah, I, I, when I think about that, actually, in my own case, you know, I, I, there are some natural theological arguments that I, I think are compelling and, and I'm not sure whether I would describe myself as being moved by them. It may be more some, uh, sometimes than others, but I think that raised for me a question of, is the extent to which an argument moves someone and that, where I take that to be more than just 
credence going up. It, it's something to do with an, a kind of emotional desire or, or um, something that propels you into a relationship mm. with God. And is that is that thing that an argument would need to have to, to do that? Is that an intrinsic property of the argument or, or like the fact of the world out there mm. that is the basis of the argument? Or is it something about my psychology? And I, I'm probably inclined to think it's the latter. And in, if that's the case, it, to what extent should I expect God to be kind of engineering, kind of tinkering with my psychology to make me react to the cosmological argument in a certain way that I wouldn't otherwise? Um, because as far as I can see, I don't, because there are certainly some people who are really moved by the cosmological mm -hmm. argument. I. Um, you might think that's a bit weird, but I do know I, I do know people. But and no, so I, I know a young man who said he went into a believe it or not, I think it was a history class at, at A level, and they, that his uh, tutor, who happened to be a Muslim, um, started for some reason to talk about the cosmological argument, and he said in the course of that half an hour history class, he came out believing in God on the other side, and that oh. was the start of his journey towards Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So obviously, for some people something lands really strongly and suddenly something clicks and and but obviously you know it hasn't yeah. been the case of alex Lucky and many them, other uh, well exactly but but that's the kind of question why why for them and not for others um yeah, yeah. and i and i think it's there is something here that rela that links in with sort of free will type considerations in relation to the problem of evil because do we think that it would be fitting in the grand scheme of things for god to be kind of micromanaging people's psychology in such a way that it makes them respond in a certain way to a certain argument because the other thing is for, for all we know I mean our psychologies are so complex and interconnected that if God tinkered with me such that I was you know awe inspired by the Kalam cosmological argument as it happens I'm not but if I if he did that um it might have all sorts of other knock-on effects uh, I, I don't know what those would be that mm. that might compromise my freedom in some way and so I, I just throw that out there as a as a question i think i think it's a re something alex has hit on that's really interesting um what why is it that evidence that in some objective sense might be good evidence but why does it have this impact yeah. on some people mm. and not mm. on others mm. interesting um and any thoughts from you lucas as, as we start to, to wind this up like I found that definitely interesting too in, in this in a certain sense we're talking about just gen generally speaking leave like atheism or, or theism or the divine hiddenness argument aside we're talking about well what's the interface between evidence or arguments and human action or human volition if you will and even more what's even more complex is well what's the interface between God hmm. human psychology and the evidence and it's something I haven't like I, I need to think hmm. about to it's yeah. you know what again what role should god play mm -hmm. in in kind of tinkering with that interface there yeah yeah I, I, and that, there's that whole kind of question that i've sometimes wondered about is is to what extent is god that interested in just believe people believing oh. in him mm -hmm. um uh you know mm -hmm. because faith is not just some kind of rational assent to something it's obviously more than that mm -hmm. um and even if alex or someone sort of made the intellectual assent that it doesn't mean that they've done the thing that's actually really important at that mm. point which is this this thing called trust faith whatever it is you know um and so on and and i can imagine people kind of getting to an intellectual place where they mm -hmm. believe something you know in a kind of intellectual mm -hmm. sense but it it still isn't christian you know it still doesn't move them to that place of actually having a relationship with god it's, it feels like you've got to say those those two things are often different aren't they yeah i think so and i think what lucas was bringing up about paul draper was really interesting about whether relationship actually requires belief and that there are some um, people in the divine hiddenness debate who've tried to argue they, they've tried to sort of suggest that Schellenberg's argument is too coupled to the to the assumption that you have to have belief yeah. to have relationship mm -hmm. um so yeah i i think that's are you, are you kind of personally open to that idea that yeah, you could, I, you could sort I of somehow so. have a relationship even if you didn't formally believe in god i think so i mean i so um there's a paper by Andrew Cullison where he gives an example of some a guy who's in a chat room with someone and they they fall in love, but then someone a friend of his convinces him that, or, or at least throws big doubt on whether 
the person in the chat room is real. Mm. So, so there are these amazing Turing bots <laughs> now and you, you wouldn't believe it. But And and the guy, um, Bob, I think he's called, comes to seriously doubt whether Julie is really there. <clears throat> but he he nonetheless continues to interact with her and, and they seem to be having a relationship. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm quite open to, to thinking yeah, that... Now imagine, imagine, you know, the, the kind of... You get into an online relationship with somebody and, and you think, wow, this is great. And then they start saying things like, yeah, and, you know, I've got myself in a bit of a pickle and you need to send me two friends. <laughs> and you think, yeah, OK, that's a bit of, that's a bit of a cost. And then your friend's like, are you sure that this person <clears> even... And, then, and you think, well, no, I, I'm not actually entirely sure. But you know what? Like, it would be so great if it were. I, I think it's probably <laughs> rational for me to just act as though it were just in case. Yeah. And so the next thing you know, you're getting scammed. And I think, like, you know, unfortunately, but, like, yeah. less less crudely, that's kind of what, what might be that's happening your concern. here. That I'm mm, sort of being yeah. scammed out of right. my, um, my, yeah. my sinful yeah. ways. Yeah. Uh, there's also there's a kind of there's a there's a different kind of evidence uh natural theology and the kind of thing that i think is usually driven at with with divine hiddenness and it's a more personal kind of evidence or more personal kind of revelation it's like uh, a, a good analogy is like with with parents or like a father or something mm. like this it's so there are different ways in which, like, my dad could make his existence known to me. Now, he could sort of leave me to go to school, wait years and years before I understand genetics, study biology, understand that all homo sapiens have two parents and recognize that one of those is male. And then, OK, so I must have a father. Or he could sort of, you know, write me a note saying, like, you know, hey, I'm here and, you know, I love you or whatever, or just sort of showing up and like mm. being there in person or whatever. And these seem like different kinds of, of approaches. Now, natural theology, mm -hmm. sort of leaving the evidence of God's existence in the sort of necessity of deriving a necessary being from contingent objects or the fine-tuning of the mm -hmm. constants, seems much more like this biological way of approaching mm -hmm. the question. It's, it's not quite like, here I am, I'm making myself known to you. It's more like, I've left these sort of weird clues mm. in sort of some of the most obscure areas of the universe now it may be true that god's just trying to meet people where they're at and it might just be that there, there are people who are interested in in cosmology and biology and and if there's somewhere to meet a person maybe that's where it is for them but when somebody says to me like look you have all of this scientific proof or all of this philosophical proof it's almost a bit like when somebody provides a, a large mathematical proof mm. of something very important you know or, of like the incompleteness theorem or, or, or something that i don't really quite understand and i'm like look I'm, I'm sure the maths is solid on this i'm really sure i've watched all the diagrams and all the kind of like diagonalization problems and they're really funky and now they've animated them but it's it's just it's not it's different it's a different kind of thing mm. to a person being like, look, I'm here, like, yeah. touch me. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. That, that's yeah, a different that kind of thing. And yeah. so, yeah, there yeah. might be like this whole wealth of evidence, which as long as you're confined to the idea that the kind of evidence we're discussing is that which sort of uh, makes us derive the existence or non-existence of ne some necessary entity, it might be like, with that hat on, this evidence is overwhelming. It, it's so much more plausible mm. that there is some kind of necessary being mm. at the basis mm -hmm. of the universe okay fine but as soon as you put the hat on of saying that this is a this is a person who if he wanted to would be able to sort of personally reveal yeah. himself to you that evidence becomes become becomes right. nothing okay. in comparison hmm. Do, any hmm. thoughts on that Matt? well a quick thought i mean i think that partly goes back to the thing about c stephen evans because i think what he's trying to say there is that it's not like confined to stuff that you have to do these complicated derivations it, it these intuitions of cosmic wonder or or uh, i i think maybe even more powerful kind of people's moral experience of the world where you might think that people do kind of implicitly go around operating as if they owe these obligations to someone so all of that kind of stuff um does seem to be very readily accessible and i suppose one other thing is of course, there's, I don't remotely think there's an argument from the number of people who believe in God to the fact that God exists. But I think the fact that, you know, the vast majority of human beings who've existed have had some kind of religious belief suggests that it must not be hugely foreign to the experience of the ordinary person, that some kind of intuition or something that, that moves them to end up believing this stuff. Um, it doesn't seem like it's just the preserve of, mm. of few philosophers. Yeah yeah um <clears throat> we'll leave it there and i've just really enjoyed having some of some of these thoughts uh, on the back end of the discussion so thank you very much for again hosting us here max and for giving us some of your thoughts thank you and uh, thank you again alex and lucas of course thank you <laughs>